Hey, this is in your best interest. I'm Philip Müller. Today, I'm joined by Freddie Lim, Stashway's co-founder and chief investment officer, and we talk about what spurred Freddie's interest to enter the world of finance and what still keeps him interested in finance today. We also debunked several investing myths to make sure you're making informed investment decisions. I hope you enjoy it, and if you do, be sure to subscribe and consider leaving us a review and sharing it with your friends. So thank you, Freddie, for joining us today. I think um, episode one, so it's going to be a great start on the new podcast. So I'm um, really happy to uh, have you here today. My pleasure. Uh, and joining us um, because the topic is quite interesting. We're going to be debunking some common investment myth, hopefully. Um, but before we do that, I wanted mm. to get a little bit more, um, more personal. Uh, I know we know each other now for a few years already. Yes. Um, but a lot of people like are really, really interesting, um, interested actually to to learn more about you. Um, you know, we see also uh, in the office, right? Mm. Um, a lot of the interns, right? Uh, they look up to role models. Uh, maybe they want to be in finance, right? Uh, and you had a quite a long career already in finance. Um, so I want to take a little bit step back and ask a lot of few questions that I have never even asked you before, right? Um, But maybe we start with like um, university life, right? What, what was the choice you made? Uh, hmm. And where did you go to university and why there? Okay, I, I think my choice dates back to mid of February of 1992, when George Soros broke the Bank of England. That's a good one. <laughs> and that's the first time where a young kid like me back then was like, wow, this intellectual person broke The, it's like David versus Goliath, right? And someone won the battle by sheer intellect. So that was the first time that got me interested in looking at fin finance. And uh, over time, I became a bit more inclined to mathematics, uh, applied math, and, and, and very curious about it, and then want to relate math and finance together. Mm -hmm. So that resulted in me choosing Monash University Uh, to study um, econometrics and economics. Um, so in you in high school, so to speak, you already thought, hey, yeah. this is what I want to do. So you were yeah. really set on finance and econo and, yeah. and the, the data part okay. of it because uh, I did a lot of research. Yeah, Monash was ranked 16 in the world for econometrics back then. Uh, the famous uh, statistician like uh, Robert Anger and Granger, Anger Granger, yeah, and all this uh, back in schools, uh, you read a lot about them. They were actively on exchange They're in the campus for six months and they were giving lectures and they were teaching there, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's a lot of uh, back and forth with University of California, San Diego, and between Monash and that in the stats department. And of course, uh, Dolly the Sheep was cloned at Monash as well. Yes. So I was, uh, I was intrigued about the school and I think it matches, the, the, their strength matches my desire. And so I went into the program yeah. at Monash. No, yeah. Super interesting, and uh, I think you mentioned a few names there, right? Uh, pretty famous <coughs> names as well, right? Uh, especially when it comes to finance, economics. Um, was there any specific teacher or um, you know, lecturer or something that you said um, that was my role model? Yes, um, they are quite a number. Uh, we have Professor Max King, who is he's like a super star in uh, modern, modeling economic systems. Yeah. Somebody who shocks uh, a bunch of equations and is, is like a system of equations and he generates scenarios for the Australian government. Mm -hmm. He's also generates scenarios for organizations around the world. So this is real industrial uh, modeling that uh, the man is doing and, and I, I'm fortunate enough to be in a, a lot of his classes and I was his pet student as well back okay. then. Um, so there's a lot of likes like that and the Dr. Xiao Kai Yang was Chinese scholar of the year. Yes. back in 99 and an extremely intelligent man so there's a lot of intellect there very academia uh, but but I was after that sort of foundations back then yes. yeah no I think it's it's quite interesting right I think for me also going into finance into university so it was also already in high school pretty de predetermined mm -hmm. because when I when I went to the US as an exchange student um, and I was staying with a family there and mm -hmm. my host dad was into finance right he, yes. uh, they had their own company running institutional money and I was mesmerized by this, right? And this was, when it says 03, 04, 
so like markets were really good right mm. institutional money was flowing in uh, obviously just before the financial crisis right but those things shape you right and yes. uh, those things uh, so for for listeners right it's like i think be passionate about the topic as well, right? Uh, you will yeah, do the, much the, better in school as well, right? If you find something that you're passionate about, that you also would like to s talk about with your friends or like you research even after class, right? Yeah, the people you um, meet um, even at that early days, yes. they do shape you later. Yes. Uh, like uh, your mentors and also buddies who are studying in the same class. And there's a lot of successful, really interesting people that I met back in that class. One comment came out when I chose the double first class honors, right? Yeah. I got it, I got two majors and, and I, I got double first class honors in both economics and econometrics. But before that success, people were challenging me. It's like, how are you gonna get jobs? Yes. What kind of work would you like to do? Are you, why shouldn't you be an accountant or engineer or architect and get a real job, right? What is econometrics and what is economics and what are you gonna do? And uh, my response was just, I like these subjects. I know I'm going to be uh, passionate about it. I have no idea what I'm going to do, yes. but this is what I want to know, yeah. want to study. And it, today came full circle. Yeah. Every single day of my life, whatever I've learned back then, I am still using those knowledges yeah. and concepts uh, today actively. Yeah. Yeah. And more uh, other things that I acquire along the way, but the university education wasn't forgotten. Yeah, which yeah. is good because a lot of people don't use a lot of the things that they study, right? That's right. But in your case, you did, which you already said. Um, you do, people were asking you, "What are you going to do with this?" Right? Next question, then really, uh, mm. and then the next segment, right, is what was it like getting your first job? Uh, was it coming out from an internship that you maybe have done before or what was what was the process like of getting that first job? Because that's also a question that comes up a lot, right? Or like I get asked that a lot, you know, yeah. what, what, what do you do after university? People feel like, oh, now this crossroads kind of thing. What are you gonna I, do? I, I, I'm a big believer of uh, getting internship exposure, right? But there's no such thing back then. Mm. It was year 1998, 99, yeah. right? and the world was not as organized or well run like, like today. There's no such thing. Yeah. And so what happened was a lot of, um, I did a lot of uh, holiday uh, vacation work um, in a small way, small companies and all. There, there wasn't formal programs, um, but I got my first shot at a real job with uh, Lehman Brothers and it was quite accidental. Where was it? Um, it was in Tokyo, uh, but it was the Lehman Asia uh, headquarters, the highest. So directly from Australia, you went to Tokyo? That's right. Okay, wow. Okay. Um, they were just going to hire two person Australia-wide, yeah. one from the MBA level and the other one for undergrad. Yeah. And I was going to try to fight for that one spot, right? Yes. And the funny thing is, I went to the wrong interview. I, I mean, uh, you're, you're young, you didn't know the difference <laughs> between investment banking or just trading yes. in the markets is very different. And so I went to the investment banking interview. It was more about merger and acquisition, mm. bringing company, listing companies or advising companies, helping companies raise funds. And it's interesting, uh, it's very, it's, don't get me wrong, it's interesting, but yeah. it wasn't what I want to apply. And my interview was a little bit disastrous. And, and uh, I walked out of the interview, um, I, you know, halfway, because it's just clearly the wrong fit. But I was fortunate that the head of HR for Asia was just uh, around the corner, and she suggested that I interview with Japan, and that's an interesting trading role, um, exciting markets role that I should go for. And they flew me to Japan on yeah uh, for, for 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 three days. And we went through 23 rounds of interviews within oh. a very short time, and and I got a job uh, Australia wide. I got the last spot. That's um, crazy. Yeah, it was just uh, very coincidental. I'm not a good example for today's organized programs where. Yeah. Uh, so I would strongly suggest people do plan properly, yeah. um, because I'm standing on this side, and I do appreciate a graduate who is well planned, clear about what yeah. they want to do, yeah. and when you have a lot of internship throughout your undergraduate studies, it really improves your appeal. And in a qualitative manner, people like seeing that, the proactivity, right? Yeah, and I think yeah. you also like, this is when you, when you shape yourself about what do you want to do, 
This, yes. is the tr this is the time to test. Exactly. Right? Even if you're an engineer, but you want to do something in marketing, that's fine, right? That's the time to do it. Exactly. Um, to, to do this. Okay, so interesting. So for fast forward, now you're in Japan, um, getting your first paycheck. Yes. What did you do with your first paycheck? Well, uh, the first paycheck went to paying the mortgage for the, ha for the family home. Yeah. Uh, the first thing I did was to take the mortgage burden off my dad. Um, as you know, I, I didn't come from a, a big wealthy family, yeah. but and uh, so we are always uh, we are very normal folks. And the first thing I did was just to say, "Hey, uh, let me, Dad, Mom, let me take over the home mortgage for for the whole family. Uh, I I'm making money now, so let me start the payment." from today. Yeah. And I did that all, every single year until they are paid off, right? So the first paycheck, um, a, a third of it went to the house in Malaysia. Yep. And another, another third was, went into uh, sponsoring my brother's uh, education. Um, <clears throat> Again, it's very traditional of me to do so. Yeah, to, yeah. I think it's, it's yeah, I don't see it often these days, but that's the first thing I did. No, I think it's, uh, and it's like also probably will make you investing feel good, in right? the family. Yeah, yeah, you invest yeah. in family, you gave back, right? So yes. because they probably helped you yes. become what, what you are, right? They yeah, they went through you along the way, right? hardship to put me through education. So that was the first thing I wanted to do, and it was a voluntary decision. I, I didn't need to be persuaded. Yes. So I was very proud of that first paycheck yes. where they went to. I think yeah. that's pretty cool, yeah. And I think uh, I always still feel that way about my dad as well because you know he made sacrifices <coughs> to send me when I was 15 years old to mm. the US. It cost a lot of money, right? Yes. Just for me to learn English. But without it, I don't even know where I would be right now because I wouldn't have met my host parents who got into finance, into university. It's very interesting how these little decisions in life right, ripple down, Ripples right? Ripples down later. All the way, right? Exactly. So it's super interesting. Okay, so that, that that's great. Um, so <coughs> very honest uh, for, uh, first paycheck and uh, to feel good. Let's shift a little bit into investments, right? Okay. Um, first of all, what has been the best investments you ever made? Okay, um, it's a financial asset. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I was gonna. <laughs> I, I thought I have something cooler to say. My well, the first, parents' one was good, right? And that was a paycheck. But and my and my brother, I don't I don't consider investing in my brother's <laughs> education because I never expected anything in return. It's, it's more about solidarity, family, yes, su yes. Like family support. Um, but my first real investment was in gold. In gold, okay. And true physical gold bars. I'm a big fan of gold. And so there was paycheck number two then. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, actually owning real physical gold. And uh, jewelries back then were more heavy in gold content. And I'm talking about a less cool version of gold, yes. yellow gold, not okay. white gold. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we've been accumulating physical gold uh, over the years, every year. Every paycheck, I always, you know, I will always have a little affinity for, for, for gold. Yeah. So you're still doing that? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. If That's I don't yeah, do it, I didn't my mom would. About you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think back then, gold prices were like something like $300 an ounce. And now, it's amazing, it's 16,000, no, it's 1,640, Correct. if I'm not wrong. Yeah, it's roughly right around there, right? Yeah, so yeah. it's amazing how, um, it, it always reminds me that in the long term, certain things, certain principles work. They yes. always hold true. Yeah. And gold was special to me not, uh, because my mom started the culture of, you know, from when I'm baby, she have this little chain around the feet and they, it's all pure yeah. gold back then. So she accumulated every year as a birthday gift. Yes. And when my first paycheck, I started buying myself some jewelry and gold bars and as a, as a custom, right? Yeah, yeah. And today they have grown in value. They are a great portfolio insurance and there's a lot of reason to, to like it, right? So um, in a way, it reminds me of a, where I came from. Yes, totally, yeah. totally. No, and I, it's, that it's interesting because obviously it's also upbringing, right? Yeah. Um, for me, I have yeah. never bought a physical gold bar. Uh, I know my grandparents had some, mm. and I think in Germany it's also physical things that mm. they like, right? It's, it comes from the war times as well, right? Mm. So physical gold or real estate, it's mainly those two things. Mm. Um, I think because I grew up with this, I'm very opposite of this because I feel like I need something less physical to me. I want something liquid, and I know we, you know, we we, we talk a lot about investments, right? Uh, mm. Buying real estate or buying a REIT, for example, right? Um, for me, it's been mostly the REIT, 
Uh, because I just it's yeah. ease or of gold use ETFs, right? exactly yeah. or easy, exactly or gold ETF. I still believe in gold, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, having some of that in in a portfolio, but uh, yeah, it's quite interesting because the history, right, where you come from, and then, but it well, makes sense, it, right? It's sentimental as well. When you've grown sentimental with yeah. the physical jewelry or or that or the minted coin and all, right? Yes. There's a certain attachment to it, yeah. and you can smell them, and they, they they will be worth something. But the thing is that you like them for their design and their sentimental value. Yeah. So uh, we do have a litter safe just for jewelries at, at home and it's insured. Yes. And it's accumulated over the last 18 years. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm quite proud of the collection. Yeah, no, I yeah. think that's it's pretty cool. And you can show it to your kids and grandkids and stuff in the future. So it's actually quite nice, right? Yeah. Uh, from that value. So <clears throat> then, you know, you've been in finance for a very long time. Uh, you know, we talked about Japan, right? Um, now we're in Singapore. Um, what still keeps you interested in finance? Like what, you know, because it's been such a long time, a lot of people, you know, they have a career over a certain amount of time and then they say, hey, I want to do something else. What keeps you still interested in finance? I'm, I'm, I'm glad I started my finance career not in, um, not in Asia. Because back in uh, Europe and US, you get a lot more exposure. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot more going on in finance itself because uh, you have people looking at fix the European the European market have a strong fixed income culture and you start seeing a lot of uh, bond issues of different yes. kinds and I was involved in a lot of this innovative bond issuance and it was new back then. I uh, won a prize in Japan for uh, for helping Morgan Stanley issue uh, the first ever zero, coup zero coupon bond for government agencies and um, my team and myself were behind the design of the structure and he went on to clock in 400 billion yen of, of issuance mm -hmm. in, in, in one go, right? So there are a lot of interesting stuff going on elsewhere. But when I came back here uh, to Asia, I realized that a lot of fund managers uh, were more specialized in the equity markets. Yeah. They were mostly stock pickers. Uh, when I first came back, I, I heard the stats were something like 66% of fund managers in Asia, they are single names uh, specialists. That's clear, yeah. Whereas I came from a multi-asset background, fixed income, yield curve, um, uh, stock indices of different markets, structured notes and all kinds, FX structures, yeah. uh, commodities. So there's just so much to do. And when you came back here, it's mostly concentrated on stocks yeah. or properties. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. So then, so what keeps you still interested? Is it the tech side right now, or is it you know what 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 part what of finance me, that you like now still? What keeps me going is that I feel like now Asia is just so much more ready yeah. to move on, and when Asian market decide to move on, they do it quickly. But there, there always there's some resistance first. But once we get over that, there's a lot of acceptance and can come very quickly. For example, ETFs were not even mainstream. Uh, when we found a stash, when we co-found a stash away yeah. uh, three and a half years ago, and now it's quite, it's quite in the headline, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, now you also see more acceptance about in investing internationally, and not just home buyers, right? There's a lot of uh, changes in the next generation investors. They are just more open yeah. to choices, and I felt like my skill set from before, now is more applicable than to, ever. <laughs> than ever, yeah. yes. Came full circle. Yeah, no, that, yeah. this is awesome. Um, so let's go over to the topic of today, right? Uh, of the episode, and there's so many myths out there about investing, right? That get thrown out all the time, mm -hmm. and a lot of people just don't, you know, they listen to them falsely or they believe in them, right? And I think explaining a few of them from, mm -hmm. you know, with your background as well, right, um, would really benefit a lot of people, right? Um, and I think we can discuss them quite openly, but um, let's start with one. And it's, uh, it's one that actually comes up all the time because I get asked this quite a lot actually, mm -hmm. is should my age uh, equal my asset allocation, right? Um, mm -hmm. So a lot mm -hmm. of people say, hey, if, if, if you know, um, Philip, I'm uh, 20 years old, mm -hmm. uh, 20 minus 100, should I be 80, 20, um, right? Kind of that, concept yep. and then rebalancing that mm. the years you go on right right and mm. it's a big myth actually i think um and a good topic to discuss in general right mm. Mm. What, what are your thoughts on that well um <clears throat> uh if we take a step back from what stash is doing but just look at this issue itself yeah. um i find it difficult to accept that an allocation a static allocation 
can can be recommended to anyone because the circumstances change right maybe I have a better paying job now but may, yeah. maybe later that changed I will be married I may have a few pets or kids and I may have other aspirations so it's hard to say just based on age that I'm a 70% stock person or a 30% bond person and I find it more difficult is that not all stocks are made the same not all stocks are risky and also same thing is for the for bonds not all bonds are safe yeah right a corporate bond of a poor quality is a bit more like junk bonds Correct. and they could be quite risky even more so than equity markets yeah and so it's very difficult to just say stocks versus bonds and so i tend to go into growth versus protective assets because uh, just to respect the, the differences in nature of different stocks right if i'm a consumer staple stocks i produce food and things that people would need even in the recession yeah. i shouldn't be classified as risky as a stock yes. i'm a grow, i'm a protective asset really or i'm a bond but i'm an aggressive bond in the emerging market world and i give you a high amount of yield but it came with a lot of risk i'm really like the stock market yes. and that's growth orientation right. so i tend to split it into that and and from that respect yes it's understandable that people tend to say when you're young you have more time to recover from any shocks that happen tomorrow and hence you can afford to take more risk yeah, yeah. there's some truth in that there's some truth in that but then so also because what i think people underestimate is also longevity and mm. just because you're now retired doesn't mm. mean you don't have to have growth assets in your portfolio right that yes. goes hand in hand with this and then also I believe that you should look at goals, right? What are my goals? Is it the goal to also hand down some to the next generation? Mm, mm. Should that then be equal to your age? Probably not, right? Yeah, I think, I that think those I think are a lot right. of things that it's the, not that cookie cutter like that, like age equals asset allocation. The time to your goals deadline. So let's say I need to put a down payment for a flat in three years time. Yeah. That's a three year goal. And regardless of my age, the clock starts and move anyway. Correct. I think that's the best example. Yeah. But however, retirement goes, uh, I'm a 20, 20 year old and I want to retire at the standard age of 65, then it's 45 years. Yeah. So if I'm older, that time shortens. Correct. So there's some truth in that one, that yes. age matters. But for other goals that's not as long dated as this one, then I think the goal time would be more important than age, right? Yeah. Yes. And so in to be clear about this example, um, maybe I can take more risk with uh, more growth orientation with the retirement goal. Yeah. But I'm likely to, to do less risky stuff when it comes to a shorter term goal. Correct. Pay down payment in two yeah, years yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. Yes. I think that's why when people like think about goals and stuff, like make sure that you set up different pots, right? Like mm. each goal should be probably differently managed yes. than this, right? Yeah. And that's why maybe for the retirement goal, you can take this as a, Anchor maybe the H equals um, well, asset allocation, I, 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 but even then I don't bring them. You know why? Because uh, up until now we don't have uh, digital platforms that is more flexible. You can invest very flexibly. You can yeah, withdraw. Before you went to the bank and yeah. said, "I want to invest." Yes. Here's a uh, here's a um, here's a mutual fund, right? Or here's an ILP, right? That, yeah. That's the usual way, right? Yes. It doesn't come holistically. There's lockups in the funds, there's minimum sizes. So I think things were less flexible back then. And today I think we are very fortunate. We're in an age of consumer empowerment yes. and technology was behind the empowerment. You can yeah. have any amount of goals now. Each goal is a different portfolio, right? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah think and I think that the big role plays <laughs> the internet in general, right? Yes. People are more educated. Um, people can do research, right? And people can also demystify things themselves, right? Because you mm. just do a nice Google mm. search and you'll find different opinions and then weigh them out, right? The mm. way uh, mm. you feel comfortable. But <clears throat> okay, let's, um, let's go on. <laughs> There's another good one. Um, okay. People say always passive investing is very easy, um, right? Is that a myth or is it the truth? I, I think the hardest thing to do in the world is to do nothing. Exactly. So <laughs> for extreme passive investors, you have to go through changes in economic cycles and knowing that a recession just came and the next three years you're going to have some annoying uh, portfolio performances and doing nothing about it is a very hard thing to do. 
Yeah. He's not saying it's wrong. I mean, it's, it's okay to, because if you have a long term plan, you keep contributing monthly, averaging in over a certain time, it actually could be compatible with your goals, right? Yes. But as statutory, of course, we go about with uh, economic regime, we adjust to the environment and we try to make it more smooth for you to stay invested. Yes. So, so that's just another approach. But in general, there's no right or wrong answer, but it's very hard Correct. to it's be passive. It's not easy, right? But people come say, so for example, like a lot of a lot of times people come to me and say, well, I'm just going to buy this one ETF, uh, let's mm. say um, mm. all country world index, equity, right? Mm. Like global, great, right? Very diversified, has everything in it. And I'm going to stick with it for the rest of my life. You say that now, mm. first time volatility hits, <laughs> It's down 10%. Mm. What are you going to do? Right? How do you feel about that? Right? And I think that's where the emotional impact comes in. It's just not that easy. It's not easy to it's stay the course. Right? I've been, I've been yeah. there like when, uh, 2008, 2009, financial crisis, when people call in to mm. work and it's actually, they're crying on the phone because they lost 40% of the value of their portfolio. They're crying, right? They're just, they're almost there to retire. Yes. They just lost this much money. Difficult, it's which not is exactly easy. why I think the financial planning bit uh, will help it will help it be easier to do passive. Um, if you don't have a plan, you just randomly choose a risk a combination like 70% stocks, 30% bonds. Yeah. And if you're unlucky that you retire and then you have this massive drawdown, but if you are well planned, so for example, you have X amount of um, cash. Um, that lasts you X amount of time. Yeah. For an older person, maybe you can afford to have a small portion of a portfolio, but that will be enough to cover you for a few years. Yeah. Right? A younger person probably can't do that, no. but have more time, right? But what I'm saying is that if you have some cash management plans that helps you stay all right, and when the market is down, you are you don't need to draw on your portfolio because yes. you already planned for it. You're kind of insuring yourself, right? Yeah. And then you have the time to let your portfolio recover. So in that case, uh, I, what I'm trying to say is you need a cash strategy yeah. and then you should stay invested. Yes, exactly. And then in the, But again, passive investing, not so easy because there's still the emotional, the human part about it. And especially, um, you know, with things like financial planning or, you know, having mm. different goals set up, you can kind of instill more confidence in yourself, right? And hopefully stick with the plan, right? Yes. Um, so yeah, so I think very important topic, right? I, I think too many people uh, think that way until they go through some downturns and we have been in a bull market as like 12 years long now, mm, right? Mm. So people are forgetting about mm. bad times. They do really quickly, right? Um, and I think, you know, maybe for you, you were in the financial industry in 08. Maybe you can, maybe what's your opinion about it? Um, I was very young inside of it. Uh, just, there was literally first job out, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and you get thrown into this. That was my, my experience was 2008 in Munich, mm. um, doing an internship at State Street mm. um, <clears> on the <throat> asset backed side, um, securitization side, which blew up that summer. The mm -hmm. business is gone. Yes. Um, but maybe you were there and just kind of from your opinion, like, mm. for, because people will, the younger generation has not been there. And the older generation has been there, but they forgot because it's been nice 10, 12 years now, right? What was your, what was your experience like that during that time? Yeah, I've been through um, 97 as a final year student, mm. right? And I invested, I've seen, I mean, I got my fair share of challenges. Um, then I seen it in August 2000 in the tech bubble bust. Seen it again in the um, 2008 financial crisis. And then seen it in 2011, European contagion. And then we have so many, many, many draw um, corrections. And you actually see a lot of it. It's actually not rare yeah. to have a correction of 20% in bull markets. Yes. And bear market actually that is a bit more gradual, but it just lasts longer. So haven't seen and enough. It's even worse, right? Pretty yeah. much, right? Yeah. Haven't seen enough, I think. Um, there's a good old saying from senior bankers of uh, whom, whom I knew. Uh, it's when the it's when the when the tide subsides, you you know who is swimming naked. Yes. And that means that whoever is the most leveraged, whoever has the least discipline and borrowed the most money to invest out of greed and and complacencies, they will be the ones swimming naked when things go wrong. Yeah. So I would say the same thing 
um, every crisis always exposes the same principles. Um, have good cash management plans before you invest. Yeah, and, and then um, perhaps averaging in, like um, invest your savings, right? No, not borrow money, and hence every month have the plan to save yeah. after expenditure. Yeah. When the markets are down, you are contributing and getting more assets of the underlying, and it smooths the noises to your net worth, right? All this uh, fundamental truth, they hold true no matter what, regardless right? yeah. of what market conditions you're in. Yeah. I really have to go back to that basic yeah, yeah. principles. No, I think, agree that they don't change, but again, you need some yeah. hand-holding sometimes along the way, right? Because people do get emotional. Yes. Um, in 08, to get back to that really quickly, um, you were in Japan still? Uh, yes, I've seen yes. 10 years of deflation in Japan. Yeah. yeah. So what was the, you know, just for people to put it in perspective a little bit of how bad it was, right? 08. How, what, how of an impact was it for you on your job, personal maybe even, in terms of like, because like again, I was very young, mm. but I mm. saw it crashing. Yeah. It was pretty crazy to see the business I was supposed to join the year after the internship. It wasn't yes. there anymore, right? Um, yeah. I went to the US then, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you, from being there four or five years before in high school to, to then when I moved there after college, very different, um, very negative, the diff you know, like no jobs, right? Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, in the early 90s, mm. the Japanese economy is so bub bubbly that the Imperial Palace in Tokyo is worth more than the entire state of California. That's crazy. Yeah. And um, back then, uh, people are going crazy about paintings and race cars, and and the numbers are staggering. Um, and then it all came crashing down in a very short time. Yeah. Right. So um, that was the part that I didn't experience. That was the part that I knew. And then I went into Japan in the uh, in two thousand, and it was already in the deflationary uh, mode. Yes. Um, but I was lucky. I was enjoying it because I was from a fixed income uh, part of the jobs market. Yeah. I benefit from demand for protective assets. Yeah. And, and every, whatever income I've earned, the purchasing power is always going up yes. because it's deflation, right? Prices are falling every yes. time for all the goods and services you have. Yeah. They're high quality stuff made in Japan and they're getting cheaper every year. So people just want to hold cash, yes. not wanting to invest. It's good for me, but then if you look at on the economic white basis, when everybody is just trying to hold cash and not do anything, then nothing happens. Yeah. There's no growth, there's no uh, progress, right? Yeah. And then you see them on a spiral, downward spiral for a whole decade. We call it a lost decade. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yes. So I've seen it. I've seen the good side of it as a person, but I've seen the bad, bad side of it as an analyst. Yeah. Of, of, of economies and markets. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. Um, let's, <clears throat> let's move on. Um, let's go on another myth that's out there. And I think that's always pretty, um, we talked about it, I think, before, but um, Warren Buffett, I think, is a funny guy in that way, um, because the myth is actually, you should concentrate to build wealth, right? So it's, and a lot of times people say, Oh, why would I diversify my portfolio? Because in the end, the people who get really rich do one thing really, really well, right? They put all their eggs in one basket. And Warren Buffett, why I'm gonna get there in a second is actually because, you know, he concentrated everything on the insurance side, right? Uh, and building that business first, right? This is yes. his core still, right? He knew this to the heart. Yes, he's diversified now, right? Uh, but he, and he also preaches that you should be investing in the S&P 500 and um, the US bond market yes. uh, in two ETFs and that's it. Uh, for his trust, right? Uh, should he pass away at some point? Yes. Um, how do you feel about, um, you know, concentrating to build wealth? Or are you more about, no, let's, you should diversify. Is it a myth? Is it the truth? I think it's a misconstrued perception on Warren Buffett because mm. there's a background to it. Um, he himself, as a professional who knows business as well, he wants to roll up his sleeves and buy companies and change the management or help running the company get better and hence sell it off later at a much higher price. It's not the same as trading, buying, selling, or even investing. But he did say that for the average person, for people without the, 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 the people, the majority of people who doesn't have those crazy sophisticated skills, um, they should just do diversification. 
And think about it, he is essentially looking at a lot of deals. He's like a VC. Yes. He he deep dive into companies. He have armies of analysts behind crunching numbers, and then they would they would also run the company, change the companies before selling it off 10 years, 20 years yes. later for a profit. Yeah. His stock portfolio was always concentrated with names like Coca-Cola, all right? Yeah. And all the top names, Shears, Candies, and today they still have it, yeah. right? And so it's sort of like he, he knows that you need to be specialized to be good at something. And that's also the kind of return you see in, 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 in terms of uh, investing in startups or new or, or VCs is it, the same. The return, always come from the top concentrated holding. Correct. If you look at uh, what uh, the book Zero to One uh, written by yeah. Peter Tail, he said the same thing. What his funds invested in, Facebook was the greatest yeah. investment they ever had. It was bigger than the return of all the other 999 names combined. And the second best investment they had was uh, Palantir. Yeah. the cyber the security cybersecurity firm that has the Pentagon contracts right yeah. that was bigger than the other 998 investments return combined and so he, there's a J curve effect in terms of VC investing where returns are concentrated where the averaging approach wouldn't get you a uh, reasonable return you still need to throw money at different startups that's right in order to get to the two right so yes um, you need to be extremely good at what you do and i think it applies in private equities and vcs uh, yeah. personally that's my opinion but when it comes to investing in say s p 500 or gen the, the most majority of traditional asset classes it's actually about the growth of the economy over time yes and it's about the average earnings and the growth of earnings of companies. Do you companies. believe that yeah. there will be more Apple products sold in the future than now? Like you're thinking about, no, more. but that's what, what you're yeah. thinking, right? Like the economic economy and companies grow over time, right? And new ones come up that take the old ones out, right? As, and that's the point I'm trying to get to. Yeah. The investing in an index uh, asset class, like say S&P is 500 com top companies in, yeah. in America. And it doesn't mean you're getting mediocre return because these companies go through disruptions. Yes. In fact, the disruptions are getting faster and faster much, much now. Faster, much, they they much drop faster. out of the index and new ones come in. Yeah. So you're actually investing in the survival or the fittest uh, over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So yeah. it's no, 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 by no way is mediocre. And hence, uh, for the most majority of us, investing in a diversified manner can really work. Yes, especially yeah. if you take the long-term approach, right? But the caveat is for a very niche area of the financial markets like private equity or venture capital investing, that this is much more challenging. You need to really concentrate your expertise and do what you know well, right? Yeah. So Warren Buffett, actually, he's an exemplary of both. Correct. It sounds like he's conflicting himself, but, but I think he's not. I think he is looking at asset classes that can be diversified. That makes sense. And certain area, you should be better at what you do right so yeah i think it's actually very sensible great advice from the legendary investor yeah i think yeah. so too and i think uh, you know when, when 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 you hear concentrate to build wealth i think people also look at business owners right hmm. because they concentrate yes all their risk every blood and sweat too on top of that and not just the financial part hmm. right also work daily on one thing right hmm. and that's uh their business and they, yeah that can generate maybe in the future more value than you working at a nine to five job, right? Yes. But it has also much, much more risk, right? And yes. time commitment and blood concentration. and sweat and tears, right? Mm. That's concentration as well, right? Mm. But when I think, uh, like you said, when it comes to the stock market, would you rather bet that, you know, Apple will be there at a, as a single stock in the future or do you rather buy the S&P 500? Right and yep. spread yourself that risk, right? For when Apple is no longer in the index, I'm I'm, I'm owning another one. Is it coming the in? The next to replace one, the new it. one, right? Yes. So I think and I think this is where it, where it really uh, boils mm -hmm. down to, right? Yes. Um, so another one that always comes up, uh, and uh, one that um, I have to mostly explain to um, my uh, German friends and family okay. because they feel that way actually, and that is. Investing in stocks is like gambling. That comes back to the thing that I said before, right? Um, and I probably would think the same way if I would have never got out of Germany. Because mm -hmm. in Germany, um, they like hard assets, like I said to you, gold, real estate for sure, right? They're probably 90% of everyone's net worth in, in Germany is probably 
Fixed income. Real estate or fixed income, yeah. whatever, right? And pension, because they have pensions too. So, mm. it, and they're going away though. So there will be a problem in the future. Mm. But um, they got burned by big stocks like Deutsche Telekom, right? It went, yeah. you know, it got sold to the public and then it went down. Um, there's a couple other ones, I not to name them mm. right now. Mm. The reason I actually got into investing was again, I went to the US, right? And the US is so open about it. Uh, I, think I think we got a different shape between single stock investing. Yeah. And the stock market. A right? general like buying an entire stock market mm. with, as a diversified strategy. I think it's very different. In the sense that mm, in the first one, if you look at any as, as, as any investment, you have two kinds of risk. Mm. A system a systematic risk, yeah. which is related to the general well-being of the economy or the industry, is much more macro. Mm. And then the other one is more idiosyncratic. Um, maybe a director just died, a founder just left the company, or maybe um, a, the, the comp the, the, some random specific events like the virus yep. that we have now disrupted supply chain and a business that's exposed, a particular business, it will be 100% exposed. Yeah. However, and when you go to the aggregate level for an entire economy of 500 top names, there's like 11 industries in there and they counteract each other, right? Yeah. So it's very different when it comes to a diversified manner. So I would disagree with your parents when it comes to diversified equity market yeah. investing. And I would agree with them when it comes to the more idiosyncratic single name investing approach. Yeah. So that's, it feels that there's a more elements of gambling because there's a lot of random movement Correct. in those names. And you really yeah. then, it comes back to what we talked about before. It's like you really need to know that company then. You know, like yes. if you do single stock investing, even if you really, this is a full-time job, right? Even if you really know the company, yes. you are subjecting yourself to a big chunk of the return explained not by the systematic part. Correct. You are trying to understand, but it's still systematic part you're understanding. Yes. That's the idiosyncratic, the random, yep. unexpected part of it. There's yep. quite a big portion. Lawsuits, whatever it might happen, yeah. you don't Infringement know. Infringement of some patents yep. and, or got sanctioned by government on your products. So there's so many things that can go on. Uh, think about Microsoft antitrust uh, yeah. lawsuits and all, right? In yeah. the early days, after Netscape complained about the Internet Explorer. So there's so many things that goes on. And it's impossible to translate your understanding of the company yeah. into returns. Yeah. yeah. No, it is true. And I think <clears throat> what, but the thing is you can, uh, the problem was always for me with clients was that they still want that gambling feel or they want to, they think they know something or like their friend told them about a stock. So I try to always tell people, hey, let's limit your exposure to that gambling part. Hey, take $50,000 and play around with it, right? If that's, or 5% of your net worth and play around with it. But because if you can't take it out of yeah. them, let them be like, and they want, and I think it's not a bad thing because you actually do some research, you're interested in something. Don't take it away, right? I, I, I um, completely agree in a sense so that's, that... But manage it, right? Ultimately, it's an allocation budget. Yes. And you, you've got to respect the, the larger idiosyncratic risk inherent in a single project investing, yeah. right? You, so you adjust accordingly that it's more volatile, more idiosyncratic. Yeah. So you can size it lower than the other parts and the majority of it should be safer, diversified, it doesn't get killed because of one event, right? Yeah. So I would say it's just a risk-adjusted approach to allocating. Yeah. And you, there's nothing wrong with spending time researching companies you love and investing in them, a portion of it in them. Correct. Yeah. That's a portion correctly by risk. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And make sure that that's, it's something that you set aside separately from the other goals, yeah. right? Like that's make right. sure that, yeah. And if it works, it works, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. But I think this is, you get that a lot. So I saw this a lot in the Bay Area with clients <laughs> yes. because it's not even, and it's not even that they wanted it to be, but what happens a lot is, hey, like, especially, and I'm talking Apple, Google, um, Facebook uh, mm. employees that were clients in the US for mm. me back then. If you, the first time I met them, literally 90 to 99% of their net worth was in the company's talk. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy over because time yeah, and because yeah, if you get and you get more every year. Times mm. are good, right? Because this was this is now in between oh nine and now, right? So times are good. Stocks appreciating. So and especially tech stocks, right? Been doing really really well. So 
they were like, oh, well, I don't want to sell it because uh, yeah. Bill next door is not selling it and he's going to tell me that he made more gains because he held on to my company. So very emotional, right? This is emotional part, but you're subject to so much risk now. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we have... This is your employer. We have met a lot of clients uh, who was um, in this fortunate position of you know, being awarded uh, shares by their companies who's, yeah. you know, yeah, the yeah. benchmark tag names. But when I show them the risk numbers in their overall portfolio, not just Stashway account, yeah. not just their bank account, but include everything they have in life, they were often surprised by the amount of risk Amount of value at risk. Yes. Amount of downside risk they, they potentially can incur. Um, nobody would put it together and tell them the number. Yes. And w when we go through a lot of those exercises, we, they're often shocked about how much yes. risk they are taking. Yes. And I always ask them the question, like, what do you, it's very straightforward, right? What do you, what do you think will happen if today mm. Apple, you work at Apple, you have 95% of your net worth in Apple and <clears throat> the stock is going down 50%. What do you think happens? 49% well, your net, impact. Your net, your, net worth, your net worth is down half, pretty much. Yeah. But you might also not have a job, right? Because yes. if Apple stock goes down 50%, I can tell you there will yeah. be some restructuring going on. Double whammy. Double whammy, right? Yes. And now what happens? You might have not saved up cash enough, so now yes. you have to sell it at a very bad place, right? Yes. It's, all, it's, it's like this, <laughs> this avalanche that slowly builds, right? And just blows up all your, your financial plans mm. that you had for your future and goals, right? Yes. Uh, and so, that, so I think this is the very, very difficult part about, uh, uh, you know, concentrating, uh, yes. concentrating I mean, risk inside your portfolio, right? Always take a holistic approach, yeah. put everything into the sim simulator mm. or, or into the risk estimation. Yeah. If you are, what are you comfortable uh, with, right? if you're an Amazon employee with a lot of Amazon shares, yeah. great. But maybe outside your company award, you need a lot of protective assets. Correct. Right. Yeah, so or just keep selling every every quarter, right? And so your, your dollar cost averaging out of the stock as well that's at a nice way. price, right? So that's one way. Quarter, yeah, and then if move you it don't, over. You have and to move buy, it over. Exactly. buy something else. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I think that that makes a lot of sense. So to close it up, let's get one more thing out of the way that uh, that that is also there to debunk. I think. Okay. And uh, will be interesting to hear your take on this because, um, as you said before, you did some fixed income as well, right? Um, and that is, people say. Or the myth says, so to speak, uh, that bonds are always safe. <laughs> okay, two two answers. First part: not all bonds are made equal. We we talk about that. The com bonds of com junk companies are still risky because yes. the underlying company is risky. Now, how about safe entities issuing bonds? There are still some risks involved. I've often seen that you know when yields are too low. And then the economy really turned around and does well. Um, actually, government bonds can still have negative return. Yeah. The coupon the government promised to pay you will not be changed. And it's most likely they will continue to pay that. But your yield has dropped so low that, you know, you, you, it's not, it's, you're, you're getting less and less protection because yields are way too low. And if the market does really well, you can probably suffer Two, two, three percentage point of negative return, even in the Singapore government bonds. Yeah. Conversely, when the markets are down, obviously you will do a lot better. So I think the best thing to do is not to classify everything as safe or unsafe, right? Yeah. Yeah. You need a, a combination of both growth assets and protective assets that's compatible to your risk appetite. Yeah. So not yeah. bonds are not always safe, not, not 100% safe. safe. No, mm -hmm. and, and I think again, you know, doing some research and also understanding different bonds. What are you buying, right? Do yeah. some research about this, right? Before yes. you get all hands on and let's put everything in bonds now because stock markets are volatile or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, thanks, Freddie. <laughs> I'm really, really excited that uh, you were the first guest ever on our podcast My in our episode. So uh, I know we'll be having you on. Quite a lot, probably. Um, there's lots to talk about still and uh, mm -hmm. lots to learn. So, But I, I really feel like people uh, will get a little bit better background on you, not just the, the, the usual one that starts with Stashaway, right? Um, and being the co-founder of Stashaway, uh, but from before. So, well, thanks uh, for the opportunity to, uh, to better introduce myself yeah. and to also express my views in a, in a more, more informal manner exactly. to our audiences. Yep. Um, I do hope to do this again. Yeah, yeah we have lots often. to talk about, lots to yes. talk about. 
That's it for the show this week. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, subscribe and leave us a review. The reviews really help us and we love reading your comments as well. In Your Best Interest is hosted by me, Philip Müller. We're produced by Stashway and we're mixed by Mo Ramley. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notified whenever we have new content out for you. Also, don't forget to download the Stashaway app. It's available in the Apple App Store as well as the Google Play Store. So you can start on your financial journey right now.